Hello everyone, welcome back to the PMFIS Current Affair Prelim Test Series. My name is Ashish Malik and this is your last part of the test number 8 where we, we would be discussing the next 20 questions for you. Let us get started. But before we go, do not forget to check out the prelims test series of PMFIS. The link is in description below where you can practice 1000 high quality MCQs at just Rs 499. It's a good chance that you should practice to boost up your score in the upcoming prelims. Question number 81 which was asked to you in the in the exam was with respect to the species and their conservation st uh, status. I would say this kind of question based on the conservation status is a very very favorite topic of the UPSC and I would rate it as a 4 star in terms of importance out of 5. There you were given the 3 species called Asian giant turtle, uh, soft, soft shell turtle, the hawksbill turtle and the lids soft shell turtle. And you see turtle is one such species where you are likely to get questions. So I recommend you to definitely check out as many turtles in the news and always try to remember their conservation status and also for other species the same pattern is going to be valid. So let's learn about the conservation status then we'll come back. So here all the three turtle species which were asked they were actually having critically endangered uh, status. So if you look at the look at the question the first two are absolutely correct but the third one is not correct because it's not en endangered even this is critically endangered category. So this is a pure fact based question and it was a straightforward question. So it was an easy one you could have attempted only if you have learned about it. There is absolutely no way that you can guess about it. But le just let me tell you most of the turtles today they are having this problem of and a critically endangered kind of thing. Uh, especially the same thing goes with vultures also. So majority of the vultures, majority of the turtles are in critically endangered uh, category. That way you can still solve it or at least you, take, you can take a little bit of risk in this kind of questions because you have this basic understanding of what overall the status we have with these kind of species. So here answer is supposed to be B only two. Now my job is to make you aware little bit more about the turtle so first if you if you talk about the asian giant soft shell turtle that you can see in the picture also this particular turtle is also commonly known as the cantor's giant soft shell turtle or another name is called the frog faced soft shell turtle the very first thing you have to remember it's a freshwater turtle which is native to south and south asia and southeast asia well 95 percent of its life uh, it spends its time as a buried and motionless way but definitely uh, you know you can find the presence of these kind of turtles in a lot of lakes, river, estuaries, uh, especially the sea coast areas it is very much uh, available. But with a, with a critically endangered IUCN status the range is still huge but unfortunately the numbers are constantly declined. You see the habitat range you can find including India there are so many other countries where you can find this turtle includes the Bangladesh, Brunei, uh, your Cambodia, Indonesia, China, Laos, Malaysia, Myanmar, Philippines, Singapore and Thailand and Vietnam. So you see all majority of the uh, you know South Asia and Southeast Asia Asian countries you have the presence. Another turtle that you should be looking at for this exam is the Hawksbill turtle. The very first fact that you should remember about this turtle, it's a smaller, it's one of the smaller sea turtles that you, that you can find. And the very uh, particular shape is the V-shaped lower jaw that it is very famous for. It is only extant species in, uh, in its own category at some points. They are solitary nesters and that actually makes them even more vulnerable and that's why the category justified to be as critically endangered. Habitat is quite, uh, you know, it's, it's also vast. Typically, this turtle is found around the coastal reef areas, the rocky areas, estuaries and lagoons. And when it comes to the, to the habitat range, uh, it is mostly tropical of all the sea turtles and it's found in the tropical and subtropical waters of all the three major ocean, ocean that is Atlantic, Pacific and Indian Ocean. That is the kind of distribution we have. And then another one we have is called the Let's Soft Shell Turtle. And this is again, this is very famously called uh, as, as this is a large freshwater turtle and this is endemic to peninsula India means it is only you are going to find in India that actually makes it even more important for the UPSC exam 
because if any species is endemic to India, UPSC is going to focus on that for sure. And you are going to find this turtle in, in India in almost all major rivers of, uh, of the state of Maharashtra, Karnataka, Kerala, Andhra, Tamil Nadu and Odisha and with the IUCN status being critically endangered. Now, question number 82 is a space based mission called the Gaganyaan mission. The Gaganyaan mission is, is very, uh, what I should say, it's one of the most ambitious mission that is ever planned by ISRO because in Gaganyaan mission we are actually aiming to uh, send the humans to the space and this is happening for the first time. So clearly it is not a second human space flight program of ISRO. This is for the first time we are doing something like that and that actually makes Gaganyaan mission one of the most uh, ambitious missions of ISRO and this is for the first time not the second time. Now if you are comfortable with it, another thing you need to be focused upon the Gaganyaan mission has is not going to be in a high earth orbit. We are planning this Gaganyaan mission into a low earth orbit. When I say low earth orbit, it actually means I am going to, uh, you know, low earth orbit means what? Anything between 20 kilometer to the first 2000 kilometers. So this much range, this is called the low earth orbit. The first 2000 kilometer from the mean sea level is the low earth orbit. And that is where we are exactly going to target the Gaganyaan mission. So clearly the first two statements are wrong in this category. Yes, the, the third statement is correct. The launch vehicle that we are going to use for Gaganyaan is the GSLV Mark 3, which is also called as LVM3 means launch vehicle Mark 3. What is this Mark 3, Mark 4? Well, this is all about the speed. So it is this Mark 2, Mark 3, Mark 3, uh, 4. They are all considered to be having more speed than the speed of sound and that is why they are in the category of supersonic category okay so yeah so even only one statement one statement is correct that is being the last one other two are obviously wrong now this is a very easy question straight away you you guys could have attempted because gaganyan mission is a very priority mission when it comes to isro's uh, future plans and we all should be preparing uh, about it now recently again it, it was the buzz of the news because the Indian Prime Minister announces the name of those four astronauts which we are going to send at this mission Gaganyaan and the names are you can say the names are not important for the exam but yes it is absolutely important that four astronauts are going and this is happening for the first time and like I told you guys this is it this is to demonstrate how indigenously ISRO is capable of carrying out a human space flight but we are going to go only in the low earth orbit not the high earth orbit like I told you and yes this is the special vehicle launch vehicle that we are targeting is GSLV Mark 3 which is also called LVM Mark 3 the special thing about this particular launch vehicle is it is going to have two types of the payload one is the crew module and another is the service module now this information is going to be very important for MCQ. You may be asked about the modules. So crew module is a spacecraft that is going to carry the human beings and the service module is it will support the crew module and is powered by the liquid propellant engines. That is important. Please understand the whole Gaganyaan mission is going to be in three phases where first two missions we are going to send as the unmanned missions as G1 and G2 where we would be sending the Vyom Mitra. Vyom Mitra is a female looking humanoid robot which is developed by ISRO that we are going to send in the second installment of G2 and finally when after the success of G1 and G2 the third mission of the Gaganyaan we are going to send the actual humans uh, on this missions where we would be sending three Indian astronauts and the fourth we are considering Vyom Mitra that's why the four uh, are there. So three Indian astronauts are going to go and we are and that is going to include a women also and finally we are going to send them into the space for the seven days. It's a seven day mission that we are targeting. Now precisely the low earth orbit that we are targeting for Gaganyaan mission is going to be between 300 to 400 kilometer that is our range. Overall the low earth orbit goes till 2000 but our Gaganyaan mission is going to be placed between 300 to 400 kilometer if India uh, is going to do it successfully India will become the fourth nation in the world to launch a human space flight after USA Russia and China and that's why 
this mission is going to be a very very important mission for isro and thanks to russia and france they are cooperating with india and they are helping us out with all the technicalities so definitely russia and france are the key um, uh, you know partners in terms of the training of these astronauts and helping us out in the mission that brings us to the question number 83 it is the question is about the indigenous climate forecasting system what is this indigenous climate forecasting system and what we should be aware about it now few things i should be talking about number one the very first thing about this so called uh, uh, the so called this kind of mission that we are planning this this whole this whole idea of climate forecasting system it is actually developed by the developed at the center for climate change research okay and this whole forecasting system is going to be an earth system model which is developed under ministry of earth sciences ministries are always going to be going to play a very key role so do remember the ministries here we are taking everything under the consideration of ministry of earth science because when, whenever it whenever you have to talk about the weather forecasting the term weather forecasting it is always done with the under this particular ministry so definitely this even this mission is going to be under the umbrella of mission ministry of earth sciences well talking about this earth system module now uh, this earth system model you may have a standalone question on this also guys what what is this earth system model you may have mcq coming on that as well so talking about the earth system model this model seeks to simulate all relevant aspects of the earth system which incorporate all the physical chemical biological processes and this it, it is not the same as global climate models our earth system model is going to focus only and only on the physical processes and this is going to account for the broader earth system that is the usp that makes this kind of missions very very special now when it comes to india's uh, this uh, kind of weather forecasting system that we are talking about frankly this is india's first earth system model that actually makes it very very important i'm going to give it a three star and uh, the best part is that this india's first earth system model has also been used for climate change assessments by the sixth assessment report of the ipcc which stands for intergovernmental panel on climate change so already the credibility of the system is so high it is being used by ipcc which is which is the apex body when it comes to anything with respect to climate change so that makes very much sense why this indigenous climate forecasting system it is being so credible and that's why it is used by ipcc here both statements are ab absolutely correct i do not see any problem in this statement because ministry of earth sciences is you always have to remember whenever you have to do any kind of weather forecasting or climate forecasting ministry is very obvious and yes ipcc is going is has already used it so this right answer is supposed to be c medium level question but something you could have attempted because the options are pretty simple and quite relatable because ipcc is the one you have to think when you have to think about the climate change the next is little tricky question because it talks about the which of the following statement best reflects the purpose of the swati portal which we have recently launched so first of all are you aware of the full form of swati portal because by understanding the full form majority of the things can be resolved so let's learn about the swati module and then we'll come back to the question so talking about the swati portal it, it actually stands for science for women a technology and innovation portal so that is the full form so whenever i say so that obviously means we are talking about women and women's role in science and technology kind of things that is clear right so it was it was very recently february 2024 this portal was officially launched and it was launched it this kind of portal is developed by the national institute of plant genome research now please let me know that now my suggestion in this question is you must and must be aware any portal developed by which particular organization and let me tell you you may have this question coming in the mcq as well that swati portal recently developed by which of the following so there it is very it, it is not very easy to predict the the name of the uh, you know 
institutions building up the portal. So please try to remember the National Institute of Plant Genome Research is the one that is that has developed this Swati portal. Why it is developed? The objective is pretty clear. The aim is very obvious to showcase and celebrate the contribution of Indian women scientists while promoting inclusivity and opportunities in the STEM. STEM here stands for the four, five very interesting streams of, of, the, of, of today's studies including science, technology, engineering, mathematics and medicine. So all Indian women scientists, whatever they have contributed in these five, stream, uh, five uh, streams, they are going to get mentioned and they are going to uh, get rewarded on this particular portal. Now this platform, we are what we are doing, this platform, this portal that we have built up, it is going to be working as a platform for knowledge dissemination. Lot of people who are going to use this portal are going to get the highlight advances in fundamental sciences and again it is going to inspire, it is going to uh, you know inspire lots and lots of women entrepreneurs uh, especially in terms of innovations, research and development and that makes sense why Swati portal has been the talk of the town. So if you look at the question, now if you look at the question, Swati portal clearly it is nothing, nothing to do in terms of sports and athletics, it is not about the trade, art and crafts and it is clearly not about the international collaboration. So Swati portal is clearly talking to promote inclusivity opportunities for women in the STEM fields of India, answer is going to be A. Now I understand the question was a little bit confusing, but please understand these are the straightforward questions and something which is in news, our UPSC always, go, uh, always UPSC is keen to ask you these kind of questions. So I would say the question level was a little bit medium, but you can still take a little bit of risk by eliminating. For example, Swati portal, for example, Swati portal, definitely not going to talk about the art and craft and very less chances of sports. So majority, majority is going to be with respect to some science. You may have a confusion between A and B, but again, little bit risk you have to take in this kind of questions. And by taking that, if you, if you really know the full form, you can easily solve this question with A being the right answer. Okay, now be careful about the Swadi portal. You may have a question. And like I told you guys, please remember, who has developed this portal? This is National Institute of Plant Genome Research. Very high chances of that being asked. Another important mission that we are going to talk about is the Aroma Mission. What is Aroma Mission? What we need to talk about Aroma Mission? Let's see, first thing is first. Aroma means what? Smell. The word Aroma has, Aroma word means smell, means it may, be do, may have to do something relating to some flowers or some, you know, something, something related to flowers, aroma, right? So if you look at the detail of the aroma mission, you will see aroma mission is properly, popularly referred as the lavender or the purple revolution. So what we are talking about, so basically this aroma mission, it all started from Jammu Kashmir to promote the cultivation of the aromatic crops, all the flowers for essential oils that are in great demand by the aroma industry. So first thing is first, Aroma Mission, also called Lavender or Purple Revolution. And it all started in Jammu Kashmir and specifically, when you talk about the Purple Revolution, it, it also has something to do with the, with the saffron, you know. The saffron, which is very particular product of Jammu Kashmir, even the saffron has this lavender, purple kind of uh, uh, leaves and probably it has a connection with that also. Now, why this mission is so important? This mission was actually started to enable Indian farmers and aroma industry to become global leaders in the production. Because not just India, the demand for the aromatic crops is very widely spread across the world. And you know because of these aromatic crops, lot of essential oils uh, 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 are made and these essential oils are a very important raw product for the perfume industry all across the world. So even the perfume industry all the soap industry and all lots and lots of household items are prepared using these essential oils, okay? This is again very important. And third thing is very important, the nodal agency. Any mission is always going to have a nodal ministry or a nodal agency. In this case of the Aroma mission, 
we have the CSIR Central Institute of Medical and Aromatics uh, plants that are headquartered being in Lucknow and they are the nodal agency of this mission and especially we are focusing on plants like lavender, the damask rose, the musk bala, all these things are the major focus and in India we have lots of states, lots of areas growing these aromatic uh, flowers or aromatic crops that includes the areas of Vidharba, Bundelkhand, Gujarat, Marathwada, Rajasthan, Andhra, Odisha and lot of states and especially these states are always having the frequent episodes of say extreme you know uh, extreme weather changes that actually leads to maximum people suiciding especially the farmers right so to support these kind of aromatic crop growers this mission is absolutely important aroma mission is very important because it not just set up the cooperative for the marketing but also help the farmers in promotion of the cultivation and processing of the high value medi medicinal and aromatic plants and there everything which is required right from imparting skills to the farmers also helping with them with the value addition everything is done by CSIR CIMEP which is in headquarters are in Lucknow so in this case guys all the three statements are absolutely correct now I would definitely say that understanding the aroma mission okay fine second statement is quite easy and I can predict aroma is going to be about the aroma industry and all that fine this may be a little bit trouble because nodal guess, guessing a nodal agency can be tricky but look what better what better than this kind of institute it is obvious obviously going to get associated with the aroma mission so even that statement is quite easy to predict and yes maybe you have this one statement which may be a little bit problem, uh, problematic I mean guessing a state is little bit difficult so barring the exception of the statement number one I think second and third are quite easy to guess so level of the question was a medium one but you can still take a risk and you can still attempt try to attempt it considering the options and taking little risk with the option number or, or the statement number one brings us to the next question which is question number 86 you are supposed to guess that this particular paragraph belongs to which personality again this is another important type of the UPSC uh, question these days so here you were supposed to guess so he was an Indian physicist born in Calcutta uh, best known for his work on quantum mechanics the keyword was first keyword is Calcutta second keyword is quantum mechanics third he was appointed as a faculty of the Raj Bazar science so I'm talking about whom it is not Homi Jangir Baba it is not Jagdish Chandra Bose it is not Meghnath Saha the right answer is Satendra not Bose so right answer is C question level was easy straightforward you can you can easily attempt it guys with absolutely nothing there is no major trouble in the question but you need to know about Satendra Nath Bose a lot because recently we have marked it is 2024 has uh, is, is celebrated as the 100 years of Satendra Nath Bose discovery what was his discovery we'll talk about that Satendra Nath Bose who was Indian physicist and also a, a, a very interestingly he was a mathematical phys physicist he is best known for his work on quantum mechanics and that is way back in early 1920s it was Satendra Nath Bose who has provided the foundation for the Bose Einstein statistics I'm sure you must have read about the Bose Einstein condensate and who which Bose it was the Satendra Nath Bose who has done this amazing work on quantum mechanics he was born in Calcutta and he was also faculty of the Raj Bazar science as the question said plus very importantly you must have seen uh, there is a name of the particles in the atomic science which is called bosons so actually bosons are named after the contributions of Satendra Nath Bose very very important guys very very important personality in physics in uh, in the in the space of physics right okay so now that brings us to the next question which is question number 87 question 87 was with respect to the high altitude pseudo satellites which is HAPS what is high altitude pseudo the word pseudo is the keyword pseudo is actually which is not real something which is fake now if you look at look at the options so what could be this high altitude pseudo satellite means something which is not real satellite something which is fake satellite okay 
Now, please understand the statements will come back to the question. Talking about the, uh, the high altitude pseudo satellites, the name pseudo like I told you this is your keyword. The pseudo satellites are called pseudo because they perform the basic satellite functions, okay, but for that they do not require a rocket for launching. Because we know traditionally every satellite needs a rocket for its launch. But pseudo satellites, they, they perform the functions of satellite but they do not rock require a rocket for launching. These satellites can observe the ground from the high altitude. That is why the name is high altitude pseudo satellites. They can observe the ground from high altitudes, achieving this at a very, very low cost. Why low cost? Obviously, we do not require a ro rocket because majority of the cost of any space mission is associated with the rocket launch and it's not using a rocket for its launch so obviously the cost is going to be much much low so what exactly they are so these high altitude pseudo satellites they work like drones they work like drones except that they are expected to be in stratosphere well above the where commercial planes fly so obviously they are called high altitude because we are going to place these satellites in the stratosphere which is between 13 to 50 kilometer of our atmospheric range. Well, talking about these satellites, they can easily be moved to location of a choice unlike the normal satellites which are mostly fixed in their predetermined path. But that is not the case. They are more like a drone so I can easily change the position of these pseudo satellites. And the best part, they are powered by solar cells and they can fly continuously in the atmosphere and, and why reason why we are putting it in the stratosphere, stratosphere don't have the don't have much clouds. So obviously I'm going to get maximum sunlight in that area that makes the functioning of the pseudo satellites even more. When it comes to the applications, pseudo satellites can be used even for military operations and even for the civilian use. For military, they can be used for intelligence, surveillance and all these purposes. And for civilian, they can be used for telecom cell satellites, especially in times of environmental disasters. And they are capable of beaming the 5G waves and land mapping. So yes, they can be utilized for both the purpose, very importantly. So if you look at the statements, now you have learned about the pseudo satellites. Now come back to the question. First statement says they perform basic satellite function. Yes, sir. But without the need of the rocket, absolutely correct. They operate at stratosphere. Be very, very careful why we are putting them in stratosphere. It has its connection with the power of the solar cells. More sunlight in the stratosphere as compared to the troposphere. So second is correct. Fourth is correct. And yes, unlike the traditional satellites, they can be relocated to the choice, different choices of a location. So yes, all the four statements are absolutely correct. I'm not going to say it was an easy question. It was a tough question. Tough science and tech question where you actually need to be aware of each and every information. So guys, in this case, if you are at least you are 70 to 80 percent having knowledge or you are aware of the of the question, then only take a risk. Otherwise, you need to skip this kind of question because majority of the times even a small fact can put you in trouble. So very careful. Attempt these kind of questions when you are 70 to 80 percent sure, then only take the risk brings us to the next question which is question number 88 which one of the following statement best describes the island on air program what is this iota iota program what is island on air program okay now that you need to learn what is this iota program first we'll talk about it number one the immature radio op op operators, they have demonstrated the expertise during the island on air expedition. So number one thing, this IOTA relates to immature radio operator. First thing is first. Why it was in news recently? Because recently this kind of experiment was done on the, uh, the Nachugunta island in Andhra Pradesh. And you may have a, this particular island can be your places in news as well. So where you have the island is in Andhra Pradesh and from there we have demonstrated the IOTA expedition where the team of five MHR high frequency stations and MHR satellite stations they used this technique and they demonstrated how the radio operations can be done using the island on air 
expedition. What is this expedition all about? It's a pioneering program that connects the radio amateurs worldwide and stations on the island. Why? The objective is simple, to activate and communicate from rare and remote islands across the world. If somebody gets stuck across some remote island, at least they still have the option to send the radio signal. The radio frequencies can be used. So very important guys, very very important. This whole expedition of IOTA, it is actually administered by the IOTA Limited uh, 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 Company in partnership with the Radio Society of Great Britain. So these are the associations under which the whole mission is done. Now please look at the question. Now you are aware what you have, what keyword you need to figure out for the IOTA program. The keyword is not related to astronauts. It is not at all about the tourism. It is not about marine life. So the keyword is simple, radio, radio amateurs. That is the program. And this program is in operation since 1964. So right answer is supposed to be C. Of course, it was a tough one. Something you can't guess. Uh, you can't guess, uh, you know, in the exam. So you can skip because this is a high precision kind of question. Or you can take a risk if you at least you have read about it once or twice. Then you can solve this question, but not easy. So be careful and always try to figure out the keywords which can help you solve the answer or at least getting the right option in front of you. Question number 89 is with respect to the horseshoe crabs. Again, very, very specific question. Not easy at all. It's purely fact based question going to challenge you a lot. What we need to know about the horseshoe crab and then we'll come back to the question. Number one. When you think of these kind of crabs, the horseshoe crabs, they are marine arthropods, but which type of arthropods? They belong to the, the calicerate kind of uh, uh, the arthropods. And when I use the word this calicerate, calicerate actually includes the animals like spiders, scorpions, you know, mites, sticks. So they belong to this particular family. And we find the horseshoe crabs are found mostly in the shallow coastal waters. That is there one thing you need to remember. So actually two facts here. One, with respect to their habitat, which is shallow coastal waters. Number two, they belong to the family of spiders, scorpions and then they are considered to be living fossils due to their ancient lineage. So whenever you, whenever you see any statement on horseshoe crab, think about they are considered to be living fossils. And interestingly, they are not true crabs. Like I told you, they belong to the family of spider ticks and scorpions. So that is why horseshoe crabs are not considered to be true crabs. They are not true crabs. Also, they predominantly release the eggs on intertidal beaches in the summer, spring season at the high tides. So this season is very important. Because majority of the marine species, uh, you know, they, they, they do all their biological activity depending on the seasons. So whenever you think or you are reading about any maritime species, always be very careful about the season in which they are breeding, in which they are doing other biological things. Talking about the IUCN status, even the horseshoe crabs are of two categories. The American horseshoe crabs are vulnerable, but the tri-spine horseshoe crabs are endangered because whenever I read about any species, I always make sure to read about the IUCN status. So now if you look at the question, very, very tough, very tough question, purely fact-based question, not easy to guess, not easy to attempt. So I recommend to skip this kind of extremely highly fact-based questions. But here, first is correct, fourth is correct, but second and third not correct because it says they are true crabs, they are not true crabs. Also, they do not spawn in winter spring. They spawn in the summer spring. They lay their eggs in summer spring high tides. And be careful. Sometimes the uh, UPSC can skip the word high tide with the low tide also. So here one and four are the correct one, only two. So very difficult question. It was actually meant to challenge you to, uh, you know, to break your momentum of doing the, uh, doing the MCQ. So be careful. Next question is very simple and sometimes for many, many reasons, I am talking about the Neuralink. Neuralink, what I have to talk about and what exactly this is. 
so yes the word neura link so neura is neurons neurons has something to do with brain okay the key word word neura neura is neurons means brain this is a technology company founded by elon musk 2016 yes sir we know about it very well and we know all the companies of elon musk no from tesla to spacex and now to the neura link so first statement is correct here the device called device called the link is actually a coin shaped brain chip surgically embedded under the skin and that is also true that's what we are doing so basically we are trying to map the brain of a person using the neural link that is the that is the idea that machine is going to respond or is going to record everything which is happening in the mind so as to understand the brain effectively and accordingly you can you can you can uh, make people respond to some situations this neural link's first product telepathy enable the users to control devices like phones computer through the thought yes sir imagine like if you just think okay uh, i want to make a call to my friend so and so you just think you just think about it and your phone is actually going to do whatever you are thinking without it impacting your laptop if you say okay i want to see a movie i want to see this kind of movie so please uh, open it so something like that you know just you are just thinking whatever is your thought process based on your thoughts the machines are doing as per your thought that is the idea of neuralink and and imagine this can be immensely useful of course every technology has a good or bad but this can be immensely useful especially for those people who are who are not able especially the the people suffering from the mobility diseases especially from for those people who are in the of very old age who are not able to move uh, independently or or maybe people suffering from physical disability so for those kind of people this can be revolutionary a long way so all three statements are correct guys now i think i know this question was a tough one but i think you can still solve it based on a common sense what neurons neuralink i mean all the three statements looks quite comfortable they are the statements are quite easy something that you can relate to the neuralink or at least you can risk this question because you have understood the basics of neuralink and something like that right this is absolutely important guys now that brings us to the question number 91 now question number 91 is what has been lot of questions in the previous year questions this question talks about the sugar cane and you have to figure out which statements are correct with respect to sugar canes now this kind of questions was very much in the newspaper uh, it was very much in the upsc prelims i think 2 years back lot of questions came based on the agro climatic conditions and it was it was a very different experience for the for the aspirants where they got to see so many questions of that level and that's why we put up this question in your test series now statement number 1 is not correct here why i'll, I'll, I'll tell you you when it, when you talk about sugar canes they are largely perennial tropical grass which are which can be grown in tropical and subtropical regions also first thing is first sugar cane is a kharif crop it is not rabi kharif crops are those which we saw during the june and we cultivate later on before the rabi season so sugar cane is a kharif crop we we uh, we do the cultivation with the onset of the monsoon so it is a kharif crop it's a important cash crop which is the main source of sugar good and khansari in our country sugar cane is native to warm temperatures and that's why it is it is mainly cultivated in tropical regions of india even in southeast asia and new guinea globally these are the major source of sugar canes this plant is also grown not just for the cash crop these days but also especially in in countries like brazil they are actually grown for biofuel production because because sugar canes have very high amount of starch which can be converted as a biofuel and and very and directly directly it is used to produce the ethyl alcohol which is called ethanol so countries like brazil are actually using it for more biofuel production but in india it is still mainly used for the by products like sugar good and khansari and let me tell you sugar cane is the only crop in india which which is having the frp the fair remunerative price i told you yesterday also and frp is a legal guarantee which is there msp is not legal frp is still having a legal backup 
Now, talking about the agroclimatic conditions, which are best conditions for a sugarcane growth. Number one, the temperature. So, temperature somewhere between 21 to 27 degrees Celsius. Rainfall, it requires 75 to 150 centimeter of the rainfall. That actually justifies why it is sown, why it is grown as a kharif crop, because there you have the monsoon coming, right? And and the kind of soil, uh, the soil should be deep, rich, loamy soil where we are going to cultivate the sugarcane. When it comes to the production of the states, it is UP and then Maharashtra. These are the two largest sugarcane growing states of our country that you need to remember. So if you look at the question, barring the exception of the first one, because it says sugarcane being a Rabi season, no sir, consider it's just the only thing you have to remember. Even if you remember the kind of, because it's a water intensive crop, no? And we know about it. Sugar cane is a water intensive crop. And that is why lots of farmers have this problem that they are not able to, uh, if they are not able to get continuous water, they are going to suffer in terms of their, culti uh, their crop yield. And understanding the sugar cane is a water intensive uh, crop, definitely we are not going to uh, grow it in Rabi season. Because Rabi season in India starts from October, goes till March. And you know in this part, you don't have much rainfall in India, barring the exception of few areas. So, especially the northwest uh, India. So, definitely, Rabi season has no connection with sugarcane. And second and third are very obvious and quite in, quite very easy facts that you have to remember. Easy questions straight away you can uh, do that. Best part, you can you have the option of elimination also. By eliminating option number one, you can still figure out the options as B two and three being correct one. So very easy question, even elimination is going to make it even more easy. So yeah, simple question, you, you have to prepare. And similarly, try to prepare other crops, especially wheat, rice, cotton, millets, you know, uh, pulses. Try to prepare the similar fact for these kind of things as well. Okay, the next 92 number question is all about the Antode An Yojana. Very, very important scheme in India when it comes to food security of the poor people. Under the Antode Yojana, what we have to figure out? Let's try to understand and what we need to know about the Antode Yojana. First thing is first, Antode An Yojana, the name itself says a lot. Antode is, means the last of the last people, especially the poor people. And An Yojana is giving them food. So the name itself says this program, this Yojana was a step in the direction of making targeted public distribution system aim at reducing the hunger level among the poorest segments of the BPL population. Make sense? Antodya, the poorest of the poor and An Yojana is about giving them food, reducing the hunger. This had to be the first identify one crore poorest of the poor families, especially it was started to give the relief to the BPL, below poverty li uh, line families. And under this, under the Antode An Yojana, the poor families are given grains at a highly subsidized rate of just 3 rupees per kg of rice, just 2 rupees per kg of wheat and 1 rupees per kg of the coarse grain. And it's a highly subsidized rate at which government is giving uh, the food grains to these families. And another interesting thing, one particular household is entitled to get 35 kg of the food grains per month under the scheme. In fact, the priority households are entitled 5 kg of food per person per month. So you can think it, think it in both ways, 35 kg of the food per family or 5 kg food per person per month. So that, that is the way Antode An Yojana is supporting almost crores and crores of the people in our country, number one. Now please understand the second statement as well. Where this Antode An Yojana, it, it was launched in 2000 as a flagship scheme. Flagship schemes are those with very high priorities to provide subsidized food grain to the poor families. All the eligible families are issued a unique Antodaya ration card which they have to uh, show at any of the PDS shop and uh, they are entitled to get the subsidized ration. That is the whole idea. There is one problem with the first statement guys. What problem? See, 
we all know about Antodya and Yojana. It's a very famous scheme and something we are knowing, something we are hearing about, reading about for many, many years now. So obviously you can't make this mistake. So Antodya Yojana, it is not about uh, 12 kg per person per month. I just told you it is 5 kg per person per month or 35 kg to the household per month. So both categories are there. So when one statement is incorrect, only one option is there. Answer has to be D. Statement 1 incorrect is the only option out of the three, four options. So second obviously going to be right. So here the question was simple. I think it was a very easy question could have been attempted because this Yojana is very very famous Yojana. You are not supposed to make a mistake in that. Next question is something we all have. Literally we all were scared when for the first time we saw that Anaconda movie, isn't it guys? I mean, I used to be Anaconda fan a lot. I used to, I had watched all the Anaconda films um, when I was a kid and yes, the green Anaconda was something we all really, really are scared because the way they have demonstrated in the movie, the Anaconda was probably the, the scariest thing we have ever seen. You know, after, and, and that to knowing that, you know, chalo, uh, the dinosaurs are no more, so Jurassic Park is no more a reality, but Anaconda we know that they are there. But of course they are not as big as, or as monstrous as they are shown in the movie, but still Green Anaconda is something which we should be really scared of. Now this question is about the Green Anaconda species and you have a few questions that you need to attempt on that. The very first thing, look at the picture and don't get scared, okay, it's just a picture. So uh, green anaconda what we have to uh, talk about. Now why it was on news recently because so far we only used to believe there is only one type of green anaconda which is there. But now recently the researchers they have unveiled that there are actually two genetically distinct species within the anaconda family. One which is southern green anaconda and the newly identified another species called northern green anaconda. And because of this new distinction in terms of genetical makeup, that's why this question deserves to be in your exam. But overall, talking about the green anaconda, it is the largest, heaviest and second longest snake after the reticulated python in the world and still the scariest guys. Yes, you talk about the characteristics, they are very well known for adaptability. Talking about their size and adaptation, their nostrils, eyes positioned atop their heads and, the, and, and that is the way they are the fiercest predators because just they keep their eyes above the water, that's it. And the whole body is submerged that actually helps them getting their prey. And yes, they are olivered covered with large black spots, blend seamlessly into the lush Amazon habitats because they are found majorly, majoritily they are found in the Amazon river itself, no? Uh, talking about the habitat, yes, I'd like I told you that their main, the primary habitat is South America's Amazon river along with the Orinoco basin. Orinoco is another important river where you can find the green, uh, green anacondas. They are least concerned because we really do not bother them and we do not like to bother them at all. Okay, now look at the question. All the three statements given here are actually correct. So yeah, the answer is C. But again, again, if you have not read about any of this, the question may be difficult, but I think green anaconda is quite familiar species. We know that they are found in Amazon. We know uh, about this common, especially if you have seen the movies, we know how they do their prey. So I think it was a, it was a, a easy question you could have attempted by simply understanding and you know, applying lo basic logic about the green anacondas. So the question could, could have been solved. Brings us to the next difficult question. Why difficult? I'll tell you. The next question is about the women exporters in digital economy fund. Again, try to find the keywords. First, women exporter. My first keyword. Number two, digital economy. Okay, sir. Two keywords. So, the second statement is quite relatable to these two keywords. You think of women entrepreneur, women exporter and think of digital economy. Why this fund is going to be created? Why? What could be the purpose? The fund was created to help 
the women led business women entrepreneurs in developing economies and least developed economies to adopt the digital technologies expand their online presence very obviously related to this again just by understanding the keyword fine fair enough and also when you're talking about this this was launched by international trade center and the wto the statement is correct but again i know this is not easy to predict this could be difficult and again you can't be doing guesswork that which country has given 5 million dollars to fund this program as a first donor so only the second statement looks fine second statement but you see the options so i my answer must be having two right and here look at this we have to figure out which statement is not correct so definitely two being correct i should eliminate the options having two because i should be finding the option as not correct okay so two is definitely correct so i have eliminated the two now only thing is answer is either going to be one or going to be three so either one is wrong or the three is wrong so this question being tough i at least i am in a position to eliminate the two options now very interestingly the first option still looks quite relatable first is correct yeah this fund is launched by the itc and wto now only problem is with the statement number 3 why it is not the us who has given us this fund it is uae who has given us this 5 million fund as the first donor so which statement is not correct answer is supposed to be b 3 is not correct so yes i can still take a risk guys by eliminating the obviously right ones so smart technique you can still follow this technique and you can solve it okay now talking little bit more of this uh, scheme and this fund because this is quite important and it has a relation to the women empowerment also upsc likely to ask this in your exam so this itc and wto together has started this fund and uh, it was way back uh, it was um, uh, okay and something you need to know about the itc why itc may be asked as a stand alone question as well international trade center it's a joint agency of un and wto now this one particular fact is something that you need to know about the itc you never know you may have a question coming on that as well why it was created in 1964 the purpose was simple to help the micro small medium sized enterprises become more competitive and more global markets if you know this much so definitely you can say okay sir now i am quite convinced why itc and wto are together doing the women export and digital economy fund so understanding sometimes understanding the organization can also help you out getting the right answer the next question is about the gupteshwar forest very much in news very very famous but we all know gupteshwar forest is not in bihar we know gupteshwar forest are famous for magar crocodiles but no, they are not in bihar we are aware of this one particular fact so making one statement as wrong and second being correct to answer is there so this is a very simple straight away question could i have been attempted without any trouble where do you have this gupteshwar forest they are in state of odisha and it was in news all over because they are declared as a fourth biodiversity heritage site of odisha i can't make this mistake so gupteshwar forest is something i would say four star in terms of importance for the upcoming prelims and this being the fourth biological diversity actually ask you to know which are the other biodiversity sites in odisha so already odisha used to have three biodiversity sites number one called the uh, mandasaru in the uh, mandasaru uh, uh, bi biological heritage site another one is the mahendragiri and then you have the uh, uh, the gandhmardan they are the three already there now guptaveshwar is this forest guptaveshwar forest is located very adjacent to the guptaveshwar shiv temple in odisha korapat district very very important and yes they are famous for magar crocodiles Uh, which is which is a fresh water crocodile we can find here very very obvious now you may have a stand alone question coming on biological heritage sites as well because i have seen the in the last one year you are having lots and lots of questions coming on bio, biodiversity heritage sites so do expect directly questions coming on that so talking about biological heritage sites they are well defined areas 
with the very unique and ecologically fragile ecosystems which are very rich in terms of biodiversity and that's why they are called biodiversity heritage sites and any any ecosystem terrestrial coastal marine inland any ecosystem can be classified as biodiversity heritage but only condition is it must be having some unique and fragile ecosystem and should be rich in biodiversity and these are some of the important components i mean every biological heritage site must be having species richness should be high endemism means having lots of flora and fauna which is endemic to that particular area must be having the presence of rare threatened species must be having keystone species species of evolutionary significance may be having the presence of wild ancestors some preeminence of biological components representing fossil beds any such thing should be there that is important guys okay and yes one more thing it is section 37 of the biological diversity act 2002 under which any state government with consultation with the local bodies can notify any area of biologically importance as bio heritage site so it actually the power to declare a site lies with the state government but of course state government must take the consultation of the local bodies after that it can be done also once any site is declared as biodiversity heritage site by declaring any area as bhs does not put any restrictions on any of the prevailing activities which were already there so definitely nothing is going to change in terms of activities even if you declare something as biological heritage site so two things to remember it is the power is all with the state government and number two that there are nothing is going to change so i really recommend you to prepare these two uh, lines and you may have a question coming on this as well so very very important guys brings us to the question number 97 uh, 96 sorry so talking about question 96 this is about the sirpur lake so what i need to prepare about the sirpur lake okay and why it is in news again very very important okay so talking about the sirpur lake sirpur wetland or sirpur lake same thing this sirpur wetland is also known as the pakshi vihar why it is called pakshi vihar pakshi is bird so you can see it the kind of importance it has associated with the birds so this uh, sirpur wetland the pakshi vihar it's a human made wetland though this is important fact it's not a natural this is not natural wetland it's a artificial man made wetland which is which is a ramsar site of uh, which is which is uh, one of the ramsar sites that we have who has made this human made wetland it was the holkars of indore they created this lake somewhere ar around the early 20th century okay this is important guys another another uh, lake which was in news recently that belongs to the kadamba dynasty that is called the karambolin lake that is a separate thing which is in goa now talking again about the sirpur wetland why it was in news recently because 2024 world wetland day which we celebrate on 2nd of the february it was celebrated at the sirpur lake indore and that why that is why this wetland was in news why it is called pakshi vihar because it is one of the 19 important bird areas in madhya pradesh in 2020 2015 it was recognized and it is famous for all these famous bird species that you can see on your screens and that's why it is named as a pakshi vihar as well so now please understand barring the exception of the first one because it it is wrongly said that uh, sirpur is belong to kadamba dynasty no sir it is created by the holkars of indore not by the kadamba dynasty that that is a lake in goa which they created so clearly first being wrong second third being right medium level question could have been attempted without any problem even if you have little bit understanding of the kadamba dynasty or you have something so some good knowledge of history little bit knowledge of history can help you out with this or at least you can take a risk because you know the options are quite easy so here answer is supposed to be two only b only two answer is the right one brings us to the question number 97 this is the question on aral sea consider the following statements about the aral sea okay what we need to know about it let's try to understand 
we know about the RLC, we know the location of the RLC that is in Central Asia. So first thing is first, RLC is actually, you can see on the map, it is on the borders of, border shared by Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan. So look, this is the area which associates with RLC. It is Endoric Lake. Endoric Lake means lake with no outlet. It's a landlocked lake. Endoric is like a landlocked lake. And it is located in the heart of Central Asia, bordered by Kazakhstan in the north and Uzbekistan in the south. This Aral Sea was formerly a large salt water lake. Please remember, it's not a fresh water lake, it's a salt water lake. It used to be, once it used to be the fourth largest body of inland water in the world, but now unfortunately it's drying up and it has already lost mostly, like almost three-fourth is already lost and it's just the one-fourth of the lake, original lake is left right now. It used to be, um, it used to be, you know, filled, it, it used to be regenerated by the two rivers, the Sir Darya and Amu Darya. But then unfortunately many diversions of these rivers was done by the governments in order to increase the irrigation of the nearby areas. And because of the water diversion, Aral Sea is now getting very less of the water which it used to get. And that's why it's drying up continuously. You can see, you can compare what it used to be at one point and what it is right now. And it is expected in the next say 10 or 15 or maximum 20 years, it's completely going to die down. So the two tri tributaries, the Amudarya, Sardarya, they have been overused for irrigation and mostly they were diverted and that's why. And you can see, this is a live example, what happens if you divert the water and their normal courses. This is what happens. So the Aral Sea is drying up and it is there. And you see, it's also a challenge for the people living in nearby areas because once the lake is drying up obviously it is it, it is having a devastated effect on the regional fishing industry as well okay now now if you look at the question here the answer is simple of the rlc so first statement is absolutely correct and even second explains it well why it is drying up why it has lost so much volume because of the overuse of the amudarya sardarya so right answer is A, very easy question. It was in use for so many reasons and so many years. Straight answer without any problem. And you may expect this question as a places in use as well. Now next question is uh, again, very pure current affair based question. Which of the following country became the first in the European continent to recognize ecocide as both a national and international crime? First of all, what is ecocide? What is ecocide? Like normally, we, we when we say suicide, suicide is somebody is taking his own life. Genocide, somebody killing other is a genocide. Ecocide means when you are killing the environment. Ecocide is any activity that actually kills the environment. You see, that is called ecocide. And which, which is the country recently recognized ecocide as a national international crime? The answer is Belgium. It is Belgium became the first European country to recognize ecocide officially as a crime, nationally, internationally. So this question was a simple, straightforward question, very easy, and there is no twist and turn in the question. So just read a little bit more about the ecocide first. So what exactly ecocide? Ecocide is considered, by definition, ecocide is destruction of the environment by humans. And Belgium is the first to recognize it as an ecocide. Belgium is a federal constitutional monarchy, something you need to know about it. And please look and check out the Belgium on the map. You may have Belgium coming as places in news because of this fact. And do not forget to check out the border countries. The borders of the Belgium includes Netherlands in the north, Germany in the east, Luxembourg in southeast, France and North Sea to the west. So do not forget to see that. Belgium is very, very popular for its capital, Brussels, which is also considered to be the de facto capital of the European Union because European Union has its headquarter at Brussels. And Belgium is a founding member of many, many of the important international bodies, including the WTO, the NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, the OECD, 
organization of economic cooperation and development and eurozone so all major these initiatives belgium has been a founding member so you can see it's quite a progressive country next question number 99 be aware it it says which statement is not correct the question is about the schengen area schengen zone and recently the kosovo another country of europe kosovo recently obtained a visa free access to the schengen area but what you know about schengen zone that is the question now first of all let's just make you a little bit aware of the schengen area we'll come back to the question so now this this can be a question in, in itself which of the following country has recently obtained visa access to schengen area i mean this may be a question in itself as well it is the kosovo so basically what is a schengen area schengen zone or schengen area it is the area that has that where all where the the member countries have officially abolished the border controls at their mutual border it's a common area schengen zone is a common area which is world's largest free movement area total there are there are 23 countries from european union not all 27 so you can't say that all entire european union is in schengen area no sir european union has 27 countries schengen area has 23 countries so 23 countries of european union and four non european union states are the members of this schengen area what from where we got this name schengen zone is actually named after luxembourg's village where the agreement was signed in 1985 it's a small village in luxembourg where all these member decided to officially abolish border controls for each other it's a free movement area and this is world's largest free movement area means if you are a member of schengen area if let's say if I, from one country you want to go to the another country in a within a schengen area you just need to have one schengen passport right you don't have to apply for visa for each country means in in all 27 countries you can freely roam around nobody is going to stop you at the borders and uh, you you can just go with one single passport of schengen zone that's it please remember the four european european union states which are not part of the schengen area includes countries like cyprus romania bulgaria and ireland these four are part of european union but not part of schengen area okay so please remember that overall there are 27 members but 27 members include 23 european union and four non european union and four non european union includes areas of iceland liechtenstein switzerland and even norway so members are very important i am i am highly going to recommend you to remember the Uh, especially these these members you have to remember which are not a part of it and which are non european union members being a part of it and if you look at the look at the schengen area on the on the map you can see and remember croatia croatia is the latest european union member joined schengen in 2023 and after that we have got kosovo getting the access to this So please remember all the important members that we are discussing about the Schengen area okay so here all three statements are correct no no wait you have to figure out which statement is not correct ha huh? okay okay so definitely our third statement is correct croatia joined schengen 2023 now it is world largest free movement area and now yeah okay the problem is with statement number 2 it says that schengen area includes all european union member no sir it includes 23 out of 27 members so clearly number 2 is wrong and first is correct so how many are not correct only one is not correct the second one this question a medium level question and uh, of course not very easy to uh, not very easy to attempt but you can take a risk or you can skip depending on where uh, how much you have attempted your paper so but yeah it's a, it's a, it's an important question about the schengen area and we all should be aware of brings us to the last question question number 100 finally last question of test number 8 it talks very interesting question it it is talking about the tableau themes in the republic day parade look all our states are uh, you know have their own tableaus uh, when we have this republic day parade in new delhi and there we got we got the tableau from all the states 
including Kerala, Rajasthan and lot of other uh, states. Now the question says, they gave you, they gave you a tabulu theme and the jhanki, tabulu is that jhanki and they want you to, to uh, figure out this theme belongs to which particular state. Now first is called the Kuda Volai system. But unfortunately first statement is wrong. The Kuda Volai system belongs to the state of Tamil Nadu, not Kerala. First is wrong. Ghumar dance very famous. Ghumar dance belongs to Rajasthan. It's very very famous especially after uh, it, was, it was showcased in the movie Padmavat by Sanjalila Bansali. And from there there was a song also called Ghumar and uh, we all know it belongs to state of Rajasthan. Murya Darbar is not UP, it belongs to the state of Chhattisgarh, not the union, uh, UP. So here how many are correctly matched sir? Only one is correctly matched. Level of the question, tough. Why tough? Because it's a pure fact based question. I really cannot do any guesswork, barring the exception of little bit questions. So take a risk depending on your appetite of the risk. So, but yeah. Kodavalai and Ghumar are quite famous and I expect you to prepare them. Talking a little bit about the Kuda, uh, this Tamil Nadu stable of the Kodavalai. So what is this Kodavalai? Kodavalai is actually an electoral system which actually originated in the state of Tamil Nadu. The Kodavalai electoral system uh, belongs to the Chola era of 10th century and we know the Cholas they were quite famous for their democratic setup. The way they used to have democratic elections is quite a thing to think about especially in the 10th century. So here this Kodavalai electoral system belongs to the state of Tamil Nadu. Very very important uh, system. And Ghumar dance I already told you it belongs to the state of Rajasthan guys. And uh, specifically the Bheel tribe used to perform it, perform this dance for the worship of goddess Saraswati. Uh, that is how it all started. Murya Darbar, it's a 600 year old um, Adim Jan Sansad, which, which started in the state of Chhattisgarh and it is considered to be a living legacy of tribal democracy. So, you know, we have in Chhattisgarh, there's a large tribal population that we have. So, Murya Darbar is nothing but a 600 year old practice, which is still there as a living legacy of tribal democracy. And that's why Chhattisgarh decided to showcase Murya Darbar as a tableau in the Republic Day Parade. So that is all from my side guys. I really hope you have enjoyed this entire video. If you did, do not forget to like the video and share your feedback. See you guys soon with the next test number 9. Best of luck. So keep preparing for the UPSC exam. Give you 100% and best wishes for, your, for the upcoming exam. Take care. God bless you. Jai Hind.